Hi everyone! I'm really excited to tell you stories about plant hormones today. Plant hormones help plants do what they do. Plants do not have a centralized brain, so how do they signal different parts of the plant to do important processes? The answer is plant hormones. Cells in different parts of the plant produce plant hormones. Those hormones are transferred to other parts of the plant and signal different biological processes. It's important to remember that plant hormones are chemicals that are naturally made within the plant, just like our bodies produce hormones. These plant hormones produce changes in growth. Nine groups of plant hormones have been discovered by scientists thus far. It's very likely that scientists will continue to discover more groups of plant hormones in the future. Plant hormones can be synthesized by humans so that you can affect or alter plant growth. Synthesized chemicals that are like the plant hormones, which have the same effects, are called plant growth regulators. They may be chemically quite similar to the hormones the plant naturally produces, but they do not occur naturally. These are the plant hormone groups that we're going to talk about today. Our first story has to do with the smell of freshly cut grass. Bring yourself to this lawn and just imagine what it smells like. Do you like the smell? Some people love the smell and others don't. Let's talk about why cut grass smells this way. It has to do with the production of plant hormones, including jasmonic acid. Let's talk about why the plant does this. In nature, when a plant tissue is damaged, it's usually by a predator, such as a caterpillar, breaking the tissues. The plant does not want to get eaten, so it calls for help. This call for help includes jasmonic acid. This call for help can be detected by something called a parasitic wasp. It smells this signal for help from the plant, and it knows that caterpillars are there hurting the plant. So it comes in to rescue the plant and, in the process, kill the caterpillar. This is called a parasitic wasp. It comes in like a superhero to help the plant and, in the process, gets its own free lunch. The freshly cut grass smell is the plant yelling for help. The smell of the cut grass is the plant's way of signaling distress. This summons or signals beneficial insects to the rescue. This is a quote from Dr. Michael Kolomitz, who's a professor at Texas A&M University. His lab has worked hard to better understand this process. When there is a need for protection, the plant signals the environment via the emission of volatile organic compounds, including jasmonic acid, which are recognized as a feeding cue for parasitic wasps to come to the plant that is being eaten, and when it comes, it lays eggs into the pest insect. You can read more about this process at this link. These are some pictures of the parasitic wasp killing the pest insect that's hurting the plants. These parasitic wasps are called beneficial insects they, since they benefit the plant by killing its predators. Parasitic wasps eat caterpillars, grub worms, and other pests. Plants have to signal to different areas of the plant when pathogens or pests are attacking. Just like the plant used JA to signal to parasitic wasps that they were being attacked, it's also necessary for the plant to signal other parts of the plant that there is bacteria or fungal infection. Jasmonic acid and other hormones such as salicylic acid are important for the signaling to warn other parts of the plant that pathogens are already infecting or may be infecting in the future. This puts the plant at alert so that they can be resistant to these pests. Think of it this way. If a doctor tells you that it's flu season, you'll take preventative measures to make sure that you don't get sick. You'll get plenty of rest, you'll eat healthy food, you'll wash your hands often, and you may even get a flu shot. This heightened awareness prevents you from getting sick. The same for systemic acquired resistance in plants. Plants are on a heightened awareness to make sure that they don't get sick. This means producing specific compounds that prevent pathogens from invading them. This is the chemical structure for jasmonic acid. Jasmonic acid is important for regulating plant responses to pathogens and stresses. 
It's also important for flower development and leaf abscission, which happens when plants become dormant, and tuber formation in potatoes and yams. It's also important in response to wounding of plants and systemic acquired resistance. Our next story starts with a willow tree. Willow trees grow near the water and they produce a very high amount of a specific plant hormone called salicylic acid. In ancient days, they would harvest willow tree branches, including the leaves, and they would boil them. They found that if they boiled the leaves and made a tea, or just had somebody chew on the bark, they would have pain relief. It's because of the high levels of salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is actually the active ingredient in aspirin. In the plant, salicylic acid plays a very important role in resistance to pathogens and it's involved in plant growth and development. It's critical for photosynthesis, transpiration, which is water uptake in plants, ion uptake, and ion transport. So it makes sense that salicylic acid is high in willow trees, which grow near the water. And it's really interesting that in the 4th century BC, willow leaves and bark extracts were used to relieve fever and pain during childbirth. Salicylic acid is the active ingredient in aspirin. Aspirin used to be produced by harvesting willow trees and extracting the salicylic acid, but scientists have now learned to synthesize this compound. Nowadays, aspirin is produced by synthetically making this compound, which is quite similar to the actual salicylic acid produced in plants. If you find yourself in nature and you really need a painkiller, you can use salicylic acid to relieve your pain by harvesting willow branches and leaves and boiling them and making a tea. Our next plant hormone is auxin. These plants on this side have been treated with auxin. These ones have not. Based on the picture, what do you think auxins are important for? If you said root growth, you're correct. Auxin was the first hormone discovered and has such a diverse effect on plants, but it has a very strong effect on promoting rooting. It is also important for the formation of underground tubers and bulbs and the prevention of fruit formation and defoliation. It also prevents the abscission of leaves and fruits. Auxin promotes juvenility. Auxin, which is made in the terminal bud, is responsible for suppressing the sprouting of axillary buds further down the stem of the plant. Let's talk about the uses of auxin. You can buy powdered talc-based auxins to encourage rooting on cuttings. So you can take cuttings of a plant, dip it in auxin, and that will encourage rooting. You can also use auxin to prevent fruit formation on ornamental trees if you don't want fruit to develop. And in commercial agriculture, synthetic auxins are used to defoliate plants before harvest, prevent sprouting of potatoes in storage, and prevent premature orchard fruit drop, which means preventing apple trees or other trees from dropping their fruit. A specific type of auxin called 2,4-D is also used to kill weeds in lawns. As all hormones, the concentration of auxin is very important. At very low concentrations, it can increase the growth of specific plants, but at a higher concentration, it can kill them. Dicots are very sensitive to 2,4-D. And, therefore, if sprayed on a lawn, this is 2,4-D weed killer, if sprayed on a lawn, it will let the monocots live, which is the grass, but it will kill the dicots. A quick reminder, dicots are different than monocots. The easiest way to tell is by the leaves. They have, dicots have net-like veins, whereas monocots have parallel veins like grass. The auxin kills the dicots but does not damage the monocots, so it's used in lawns. The next plant hormone story is gibberellins. This is a plant that's untreated with gibberellins and this one has been treated with gibberellins. What do you think the effect of gibberellins are on plant growth? If you said elongation, you're correct. Gibberellins are actively associated with stem elongation, breaking dormancy of seeds and buds and tubers, and increasing flower, leaf, and fruit size. 
It also induces flowering in plants that normally require fertilization or a specific photoperiod. So you can overcome the need for fertilization or a specific photoperiod using gibberellins. Gibberellins have a few important uses in greenhouses and horticulture. Gibberellins can be used to form taller trees, increase the sizes of grapes. For example, this is a picture of grapes that have not been treated by gibberellins, and these have. You can see that the cell elongation increases the plumpness of the grapes. Gibberellins can also be used to substitute the need for vernalization of plants growing in an area that is warmer to than that that they've been adapted. We learned last time that some plants need a vernalization to induce flowering, so gibberellins can be used to reduce the need of those cold hours. Next, we will talk about cytokinins. Cytokinins are known as the plant hormone that helps with cell division and above ground growth. Cytokinins are believed to work in conjunction with light to increase cell division and enlargement. They have also been shown to prevent chlorophyll degeneration and break axillary bud dormancy. Their only commercial horticulture use is in tissue culture where they stimulate callus growth. Cytokinins are used to increase above ground growth, whereas auxin is used to encourage root growth. Our next story is about drought stress and the role that abscisic acid plays in making plants more drought tolerant. Drought is a problem in many areas of the world. When plants don't get enough water, they're stressed and they cannot produce food as easily. That's why it's important for plants to have water stress or drought tolerance mechanisms. Remember when we first talked about roots and their importance? We went over many different examples of how roots are important, such as anchoring the plant, protecting the plant from predators, and uptaking water and nutrients. We also said that roots act as a spy in the soil, making sure that there's enough water for the plant growth. ABA is that signal that plants use to let the above ground plant know that there's a lack of water. That lack of water means that the plant has to slow growth and increase root investment so that the plant can get more water. If plants just continue to grow like nothing's happening, they'll run out of water and completely die. But if their growth slows and they close their stomata and they wilt, they'll reduce their water loss and they'll be able to hold strong or be resilient until more rains come. In order to prove that the roots were producing this important drought hormone signal called abscisic acid, scientists devised an experiment. What they did is they split the root system of a plant into two sides of a divided pot. So they took the plant, split the roots, put half of them on one side and the other half on the other side. They could then treat these two different areas uniquely. So the first pot, they watered well on one side, meaning that this plant actually had enough water, and they drought stressed it on one side. The other pot, they drought stressed both sides, and as a control, they well watered both sides of the plant, making sure that the stress of splitting the roots did not make the plant make these hormones. The plant that was well watered on both sides continued to grow healthy and did not wilt, but the plant that was drought stress on both sides wilted. The plant that was well watered on one side, meaning that the plant actually had enough water but was drought stress on one side, had the same result as the plant that was drought stress on both sides. That's because the drought stress side was producing ABA and signaling the above ground plant to wilt and reduce loss. This ABA also signals closing the stomata and increasing root growth, important factors for reducing water loss and increasing water uptake. ABA is essential in the drought tolerance of plants because it signals the availability of water in the root system. Abscisic acid is very important in plant stress resistance, as we just discussed. It's also involved in inducing dormancy and inhibiting seed germination. It can 
Its action can be counteracted by growth-inducing chemicals such as auxin, gibberellin, and cytokinins. Abscisic acid has also been shown to be a growth retardant that may induce abscission. Next, we're going to talk about ethylene. Ethylene is a plant hormone that has to do with ripening. This side has very low ethylene, and the increasing concentration of ethylene will increase the ripening of bananas. Ethylene is the plant ripening hormone. Plants in nature naturally produce ethylene to initiate ripening of fruit. But because of transportation needs, many farmers harvest tomatoes when they're still green. That is to prevent the tomatoes to being damaged in shipping. Because tomatoes get softer as they ripen, they would be completely smushed in the crates if they were harvested at full maturity. For this reason, grocery stores spray tomatoes with synthetic ethylene to initiate ripening. This box has not been sprayed with ethylene and this one has. You can see that the ethylene initiates ripening of the fruit. Ethylene is also important in plant aging. In plant roots, ethylene actually inhibits elongation of roots. Other plant hormones offset this, however, such as auxin, which is essential for early root development. It promotes root elongation at very low concentrations, and it inhibits at very high concentrations. It also, auxin also promotes lateral root formation, which is important for the plant to keep branching out to gather more water. Abscisic acid promotes elongation, especially under drought stress conditions. Some plant hormones act as a growth retardant, such as ethylene. Growth retardants can be used on hedges and lawns to slow growth and decrease maintenance. Specific products are sold as growth retardants. As we've discussed, plant hormones can have huge effects on plant growth. For that reason, scientists work eagerly to study these, but there is challenges to working with plant hormones. Plant hormones can affect different plant species uniquely. Slight changes in hormone concentration can alter their effects completely. That means that slight concentration hormone differences can cause the plant to do two very different things. The right concentration can help the plant live, and the wrong concentration can kill the plant, as we learned for 2,4-D. Just like hormones in our own bodies can be affected very easily and concentration of hormone drugs is very important. Hormones tie into how we feel and our growth, just like plant hormones are essential in plants. If you're on a hormone drug such as birth control, it's essential that you make sure that concentration is right. The wrong concentration can cause huge problems such as depression and even higher risks to suicide. The same goes for plant hormones. The concentration is essential to monitor so that your plant growth is increased, not decreased. Also, plant hormones, same as our bodies, can frequently be found and act together in unison to do different things. That means the ratio of two different hormones are really important. It's difficult to determine which chemical or which hormone is responsible for a specific effect because there's two that are increasing or decreasing concentration at different times. That being said, scientists have developed ways to study plant hormones, such as plants that are mutant in hormone production Certain plants cannot produce certain hormones, so you can see what their growth looks like and how they respond to other hormones. Scientists can also synthetically produce or extract hormones to apply to plants and study the effects. Scientists can also analyze how much hormones are in a specific plant sample using LCMS machines. And scientists who study hormones can collaborate and work on research projects together. Scientists also use green fluorescent proteins to detect when a specific hormone is being used. So they use genetic constructs when a specific hormone is being produced. A green pigment would also be produced that can be visualized underneath a microscope. 
Scientists use green fluorescent protein and RFP, red fluorescent protein, to tag specific genes that they're interested in. In this picture, the scientist is studying lateral root formation via auxin signaling in a plant called Arabidopsis. In addition to plant hormones, horticulturists also use other chemicals to modify plant growth. Sometimes, horticulturists do not want a plant to get very tall. They want to keep it more bushy. They use something called a pinching agent to promote branching and more bushy, attractive growth for certain plants. Occasionally, vitamins have even been sold to promote plant growth. However, further research needs to be done because on many of these, the effect on plant growth is unsure, meaning that you could just be buying something that's not actually helping your plant. Today, we've heard many different stories about plant hormones. Let's summarize the main roles of each plant hormone that we've covered. Auxin is essential for root growth. Gibberellins is essential for cell elongation. Cytokinins is important for above ground growth and cell division. Ethylene is essential for plant ripening. Abscisic acid is important for drought signaling. Salicylic acid is important for resistance to pathogens and is the active ingredient in aspirin. Jasmonic acid is essential for regulating plant responses to pathogens and stresses. That's when we talked about the cut grass example. Here's some practice questions that I want you to go over with your partner or on your own. A plant that has non-parallel leaf veins, which is a dicot, is overgrowing the grass in my yard. If I need to kill it without killing the grass, what should I do? Explain why. If you want to take a plant cutting from a plant in my house, such as an ivy, what should I do to encourage rooting? How should I do this and what happens? If I really want to make guacamole tomorrow using avocados, but my avocados are not ripe, what should I do to enhance or speed up their ripening process? Plants call for help. Tell the story of why cut grass smells and what the result is in your own words. What painkiller is a derivative of a plant hormone? Explain how people started making money on this. If a plant is experiencing extreme water stress, which means too little water in the soil, what hormone will increase and what will that cause the plant to do? How is ethylene used in plants? Is it natural? How is it used in grocery stores? Many of these questions were answered in today's lecture. Others you may need to do a little research on your own. I hope today opened your eyes to all the important roles that plant hormones play in plant development. Remember to review these and think of your own stories to help you remember them. Until next time, have a great day.